Alright, so who would like to be the first to ask a question, please? Over here. Um, what did you, um, or how did you get through the experience, and what did you learn about yourself through the, the six year experience? Okay, a um, combination of things got me through the experience. Um, my family support was paramount. The support from my blog readers, they started to send letters to me and, and books, not just to me, but also to the other business as well. I felt like they were there with me in spirit. Got into yoga and meditation, and um, you know, when I was moving in with the cockroaches, uh, I couldn't sleep with the cockroaches crawling on me, constantly waking them up with them, tickling the palm of my hand and stuff like that. And I started to see imaginary cockroaches and hear voices, because when you go days without sleep, that's what happens. So they put me on some medication, but kind of like made my brain all foggy with side effects to the medication. But I started to meditate for hours and hours. And the meditation got my anxiety down and got me off the medication. Yeah, so, you know, um, all this, all this good people who protected me and supported me, my family, blog readers, reading and writing. Writing about the situation helped me deal with it. It's cathartic. Um, you know, and I look back at you know, what I've written and I, I can see changes in my mood and that is a way that I've looked inside myself through journaling. Because before I got arrested, I was just zipping through life, you know, without thinking about the consequences of my actions. I think most people are. They never sit down and, and say to themselves, all right, I'm going to take hours right now to think about my life and what and all this stuff. And, but in prison, you're forced to do that. It was the first time I had introspection. And the drugs had put a cloud in my head as well. So when I was running around on the drugs, doing all these stupid things, the drugs was telling me in my brain, this is the coolest thing in the world. You're living like a movie, like Pulp Fiction. You know, I didn't know that cloud was there until I soaked up. And once that cloud soaked up, first thing I thought to myself was, how on earth was I still alive because of all the dangerous situations I put myself in? So then I asked myself, why did I behave like that? And I started to read. I read over a thousand books in just under six years, and I never read properly until I got arrested. All I was interested in was finance books. So on this fantastic journey through literature, and I read a lot of the original texts in psychology and philosophy in order to try and better understand myself and my past behavior. And I discussed what I was reading with the psychotherapist in the, the psychotherapy session is about 10% of, of the prison time book. And he forced me to really look into, inside myself and to put these philosophical quotes into the context of how I could use them in my life. And to this day, I still fall back on what he taught me. Yeah, so, you know, there were some good people in there who came along out of the loop to help me, such as the second therapist, it was brilliant. All right, that's the first question then. Um, yep. So everything that happened there is still haunting you now? Is what still happens to now? Yeah, it's haunting Oh, haunting to me now. Yeah. Um, when you go through something that's a life and death environment, and you're seeing people get murdered in front of you. For example, in the Bang of Abroad episode, it shows the gang smashing a guy in the shower at the beginning. But what it didn't show was the proper damage that was done to that guy because it was family viewing the Bang of Abroad episode. The gang smashed this guy and they come out and then this big guy with cobwebs on his neck says, how come we can still hear him? Because he was whimpering in a pool of blood. And the gang were like, oh, we smashed him good. The big guy was like, not good enough. And he just goes into the shower, gets the guy's head. And it's like he's trying to crack it open like it's a coconut, just crack, crack, crack. The body's laying there, and a guard's a security walk. He's like, lock down, everybody, lock down. So I went back to my cell, put my face to the window because I wanted to see what the damage was on this guy. And he comes out, he looks dead, he's on the stretcher, and there's not just blood coming out of his head, there's yellow fluid, like brain stuff. I still have nightmares about all the violence that I saw, but I don't want to sound self-pitying because like I said, I wrote the law, I deserve to be punished, and it actually strengthened me and did me a lot of good, even though there's a bit of a double-edged sword because of you know, nightmares and, and, and flashbacks and stuff like that. I can be walking down the high street, for example, and I'll see someone who looks a bit like the serial home invader torturer, and I'll have a flashback, and it happens in a split second, you get this reaction, your heart speeds up, you sweat, 
and you know you just tense up. But within that same second, you realise that it can't possibly be that person. But the reaction has been set in motion, and it takes a little bit for your system to calm back down. Now, the nightmares and the flashbacks were happening a lot when I first got out. Like nearly every night, I was getting killed in my dreams and stuff like that. People were trying to kill me. And then it kind of went from the prison world when I was over to the real world. For example, I'd be doing a talk at school and then the, the serial home invader torture would be coming into the school to get me and stuff like that. But I do so much yoga and meditation these days um, that it's really gone down a lot. And I think sharing my story as well, people say, look, you're reinforcing it. You, you, you're, you're reliving it every time you tell your story. How can you do that? But I personally feel that when something traumatic happens to someone, if they share it with people, actually you're unburdening it, you're actually working your way through it. And that, that's, it might not, that might not work for everyone, but that really has worked for me. People I've met who've been in prison and have had traumatic things happen to them who won't talk about it at all. When I'm out with those people and people bring up the conversation about prison, you can see they just get really, really tense and they don't, you know, they just want that conversation to end. So, you know, I didn't have a clue about the inner journey until I got arrested and reading all the psychology and philosophy and discussions with the psychotherapist gave me the tools you know, to, to, to deal with that kind of stuff. So that's, it's, it's ongoing, you know, but obviously they have nightmares for the rest of my life, but they're going down. At the back, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your experience. It's, uh, it's truly, truly remarkable. Thank you. Um, you seem very positive and, you know, have you always been a positive person or is that something or when did that start when did you start turning this horrific sort of experience <coughs> into something positive i've always been a happy-go-lucky person but in my teens i hit a time when i got anxiety and it carried through to the point where if i went out to a nightclub i woke up and dance i was too self-conscious i woke up and talked to women and stuff like that and that was why I started ecstasy, pretty much because once I did ecstasy, I would not stop dancing, I talked to half the club, and it totally became this party animal through it. Um, but, you know, like I said earlier, it just it, it, it led to all these bad things. Um, I'm not recommending that to anyone. Um, but yeah, I'm still that naturally positive person that, that, that I always have been. And going through this in prison, Two Tonys taught me to appreciate the small things. His favourite book was A Day in the Life of Ivan Donosevich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. These guys were in the Russian gulag getting worked to death. It was so cold, if you spat, your spit froze mid -er. So if the prisoners complained about something um, in the prison where we were at, Two Tonys would be like, you know, breakfast cold. You know, in, in where, where Ivan was, they were fighting over a fish eyeball in the soup. So I really learned to appreciate the small things. When I wake up, I wake up with a smile on my face. There's no dead rats in my food. There's no cockroaches in my bed. But God, it's so good, especially in the West. Really, people really take for granted what we've got here. A lot of the world has not got the wealth that the West has got. And you know, I really, I really see that now. And once you've, once you've had everything taken away from you, and you get it back, you learn what what you've lost is valuable, and you then appreciate it for the rest of your life. So that, that helps me keep smiling as well as the yoga. <laughs> um, going well, turning back into this country, you know, you you're in prison. I don't think it's ideal whether it's maximum or however. Yeah. You know, people who reoffend, they've been in the prison system. They've seen how these sort of episodes happen, however they may be, and yet they reoffend and go back to prison. Yeah. Um, to go back to that life, um, whatever circumstances may be out in the open, but how, how do you sort of, what is your thoughts on that? Okay, in America, reoffending is by design, as well as the criminalization of addiction. 90% of the guys in prison have addiction issues. Allow it to be completely flooded with drugs, 